Center on Precision Public Health Beyond Genomics. A brief word about logistics and we'll be off. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, this session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us avoid any backup noise. We encourage questions. They can be submitted by using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen on the WebEx platform. Type your question into the Q&A field and hit submit. Feel free to submit your question at any time but we will be opening the session for questions when the presentation is finished. Without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce and turn the meeting over to Dr. Maureen Corey. Thank you very much, Emily. <clears throat> uh, this is Maureen Corey uh, from the CDC Office of Public Health Genomics. I'd like to welcome you all to the, our third installment on precision medicine and population health. We're in for a good treat today with uh, two wonderful speakers. Uh, just by the way of background, um, we kicked off this series back in May this year, <clears throat> and the, the two, two previous webinars are already available on, on the NCI website with the podcast and all the slides. And uh, I think this one will be two as well within <clears throat> the next few weeks. So I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Uh, the segment, they will go 20 minutes each, and then we'll have some time at the end for people to send in questions for Q&A. So our first speaker is <clears throat> Dr. Bill Riley, who is the director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research and the Associate Director of NIH for Behavioral and Social Science. He has been at NIH since 2005, where he first served as a Deputy Director for the Division of AIDS and Health Behavioral Research at the NIH. In 2009, he went to NHLBI to be Program Director for the Clinical Applications and Prevention Branch in the Division of Cardiovascular Sciences. Then we knew him at NCI here since 2012, when he was the Chief of NCI Science of Research and Technology Branch of the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. Bill is a clinical psychologist by training. His research interests include behavioral assessment, psychosocial health risk factors, tobacco use and cessation, and the application of technology to preventive health behaviors and chronic disease management. He's been interested in applying new technologies, particularly mobile and wireless technologies and behavioral measurements and intervention, and as well as the potential for these technologies to assess and intervene adaptively in the context of behavior with broad reach of scalability. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Bill on our Precision Public Health uh, paper last year, and you'll be hearing more directly from him in just a minute. Our second speaker is Kirsten Bibbins Domingo, who's a cardiovascular epidemiology from UCSF. Her expertise in development of cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes risk in young adults. She holds a Lee Goldman MD Endowed Chair in Medicine and a Professor of Medicine and of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF. She's also the Director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, a research center focused on discovery, innovation, policy, advocacy, and community engagement. Dr. Bivens Domingo work focuses on racial, ethnic, and income differences in manifestations of chronic disease, intersection of biological, behavioral, and environmental factors that influence risk, as well as effective clinical and public health policy interventions aimed at prevention. She's been a member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force since 2010, and she's the current chair of the task force. She's also a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and has been elected to the National Academy of Medicine, I believe, last year. So Kirsten has uh, been telling us about uh, an amazing uh, a summit on precision public health that UCSF uh, has held uh, earlier this year. So without further ado, I'm going to turn um, uh, the mic to uh, Bill uh, to start us off with the first presentation. Thank you, Mouli. Um, and thank you all for the opportunity to talk a bit about precision medicine, uh, which I've been involved in for the last, gosh, almost two years, actually more than two years as I count back. Um, as well as um, some thoughts about that related to behavioral sciences and behavioral research. So um, I, normally in this context, you talk about, um, you know, the average treatment for the average patient and being more precise clinically. I'm going to take a different sort of backdrop as I think about this and, and spend a moment just talking about how we've typically done research in a research poor environment. And by that I mean that most of the health research that we do um, 
we're, we're always looking for and trying to drag in data um, and do the work that we need to do to gather the data. It's not readily available to us. So our priority in research is on perspective design and data collection. We have very limited data collection opportunities in this data poor environment, so we go out and we make collection of data happen. Our data is predominantly cross-sectional and minimally longitudinal, and we'll think about the typical clinical trial where we get baseline and maybe mid, certainly post, sometimes follow up, and that's pretty much the end of our longitudinal perspective. Um, and then because we're data poor, um, the tendency is to not be able to assess all the various sort of confounds, which, and keep in mind that what we now call confounds, we now call um, mediators, moderators, precision medicine components. Um, so they're not things to be swept away, they're the things we actually care about, which are the things that interact with our interventions to make them more or less effective by individuals or various people. And we control those confounds now via randomization, which leads us to the sense of the average result for the average patient, um, because we've randomized away all the things that are potentially predictive of their outcomes of course of time. So next slide, um, just thinking about what a data-rich environment would look like and how that would apply to health, and these are just some examples. Uh, meteorology, plate tectonics, uh, uh, hydron supercollider, uh, cosmology, all are basically data-rich sciences. And the, the things that make them data-rich is the fact that they're temporally dense. The data they collect is very temporally dense. They use computational models. They move beyond just statistical modeling to computational models um, of behavior that allows them to predict. So in most of these data-rich sciences, the core issue is not so much whether with the causal inferences, the more important thing is, can you predict and can you ultimately preempt? Um, and that's just a slightly different focus from the way we've traditionally done clinical research. The next slide. So just a quick example of what, how if you think about our health sciences and how they might change from a data poor to a data rich one, just an example for meteorology. And we were kind of in the same place meteorology was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And we have local limited measurement, um, and they then subsequently leveraged communication technologies, and that day it was the telegraph, and now we have much better communication technologies to do this, to connect their data across sites and also connect it across time. They set standards for data integration so that what your barometer says and what my barometer say, says are all co-calibrated and measure on the same metric um, so that we can share data more easily. And they continue leveraging technical advances for the measurement and communication effort. So they ended up with a rich and integrated computationally modeled data set to explain and predict phenomena moving forward. So the question is whether health research can become that kind of data rich science in which we're not going out and spending most of our efforts seeking data, analyzing it, and then putting it on a shelf, but instead having this constant flow of health research data from which we can draw to be able to answer most of our questions. The next slide. So I think there, getting close to there in the behavioral sciences, which is near and dear to my heart as Director of Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, and I'll just point out sort of four areas where I think we're, the traction is now happening and we're able to leverage some technologies to be able to do this. One which we've done for a long time, for well over a decade, is ecological momentary assessment. And being able to now deliver that in cell phones so we can do prospective, random, or event-based sort of self-report and as opposed to retrospective self-report, has really changed the way we think about data. Um, I'll tell you from the world of tobacco, for many, many years we thought, well, um, stress was a critical factor in relapse. It turns out that if you randomly um, look at people uh, prospectively in EMA and measure their stress levels, there's, they're stressed out all the time, the smokers are. They just attribute their relapse to the fact that they were stressed out, but there are many other times that they were stressed out They didn't relapse. We wouldn't have known that without EMA data. Um, the other one that's been really exciting, I think, has been the capture of digital breadcrumbs from daily interactions with technology. So we lead data, this is Sandy Pentland's term at MIT, we lead data scattered about our daily lives as we go through. Um, most of that's been leveraged thus far with social media, but there's additional things we can do with called data records, with consumer sensors that people have available to them. Even the computer on my car would likely tell you what my stress level is by the time I get to work every morning. So there's data like that that we could actually leverage better than we do now. But there's a lot of data on behavioral and social factors that are out there for us to utilize. 
And then, of course, there's the explosion of sensor technologies that allow us to be able to measure physical activity, smoking, sun exposure, et cetera, et cetera, in ways we've previously not been able to do. And then all of that data pouring in, being able to more computationally model it, to be able to take that intensely longitudinally dense data and turn it into meaningful information for us. So I think we're there for behavioral stuff. Now, just a quick thought about sort of precision behavioral interventions before I get into precision medicine. We've been doing this for a long time. We just didn't call it precision, right? Even back in the days of, well, first of all, uh, Francis Collins wrote a paper back in 2004 about a large cohort to look at genetics and exposure. Um, before Collins, uh, Elias Zerhouni um, talked about the five Ps, and those included things like personalization and uh, predictability and uh, preemption. Um, so we just didn't call it precision back then, but we've been talking about these sort of things for many, many years. And the behavioral sciences, one of the kind of standard ones that people pull from history is project match. Um, NCI now has a project match, but in the 1990s, um, NIDA and NIAAA um, teamed up to fund a large study to look at could we match different alcohol abuse treatments to different types of individuals over the course of time. Um, that, uh, those of you who know that large study didn't work out that well. They weren't able to find a sort of specific response to specific subgroups of people. Um, but that was one of the first efforts, I think, in the field to begin to look at are certain treatments more effective for one group of people versus another. Probably more work has been done in the last few years on internet tailored interventions, which are essentially precision or personalized interventions, um, where the baseline data using expert systems, primarily around um, trans-theoretical model um, and what stage of change people are in, to be able to deliver interventions based on that stage of change. And there's been some, uh, a, actually a fairly large body of research in this area to show that those tailored interventions um, are more effective than the non-tailored versions of those in most internet, not all, but in most of the internet sort of um, efforts um, that go on. We're, we're moving beyond that, right? So if you think about what we mean by precision medicine is that uh, beyond saying that treatment A is better than treatment B on average. Um, so the question that's in the precision space is for whom? Um, so it's, it's basically a baseline question, right? It's what moderators predict whether a person will or will not respond to a specific treatment. But then we have additional questions in the behavioral sciences that are even more um, in-depth than that. In what context and at what time um, are those interventions more effective? There's actually been some writing in the literature about the fact that it really isn't so much the intervention, it's the intervention, if we kept delivering that same intervention at different points in time, a person would likely respond to it at some point. They just have to find the right time in their life when they're more ready to actually produce behavior change. And so some of our technologies like uh, uh, just-in-time adaptive interventions, or ecological momentary interventions, are interventions attempting to time the intervention to the context and the situation in which the person um, is most likely to make that change. And then the other is that we don't have a single active treatment behavioral interventions. We have multi-component treatments. So as a result, we also have to think about in what combination and what sequence these interventions should occur. And that's where some of the most are smart designs that are being used for sequential sort of strategies and that sort of thing to help us better understand those. Let me move on to the next slide in interest of time. So this is our president uh, almost two years ago um, announcing the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, I will tell you, I told Maureen earlier, the White House continues to be um, involved in this effort, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, but always more involved and always interested in what we're doing on this project. Uh, so, and then at the same time that that happened, and this is a good sort of initial sort of perspective on the thinking behind the Precision Medicine Initiative. This was an article that Francis and Carl Varmus, who was the NCI director at the time, um, wrote about uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. And I think if you read that, you'll realize that this is much more in terms of the way people have thought about this than um, being able to just look at genetic factors and pharmacogenetic um, pers perspectives, but also looking at lifestyle and social context and other factors that are responsible for this as well. Um, not everybody in the public health space was really enthusiastic about the precision medicine effort. I know that Maureen and uh, Sandro had a nice discussion about this in their first meeting. Um, but there, there, there are clearly challenges in, one, trying to make sure that public health issues and population health issues get included in precision medicine um, and ensuring that it, the wide swath of this all happens in, in uh, a reasonable way. 
So um, we wrote a small paper on this not too long ago, just about sort of behavioral and social science um, factors in precision medicine, um, and tried to sort of describe this as being much more than genes and drugs and disease, but reasonable hypotheses that we could make about subgroups that are characterized not by their genes, but by behavioral and environmental exposures, and then how they may respond differentially to treatments. Um, and then uh, Marin, uh talked about this briefly. Um, he led, a, I thought, it was a very nice paper of just thinking about precision public health and how sort of precision medicine could be thought of from a public health perspective um, and how we can think about providing the right intervention to the right population at the right time, given some of the information technology and data science capabilities that we have, and especially with some of the enhanced surveillance capabilities that we currently have available. Um, I will do this one very really quickly um, in the interest of time. Um, this is Glass and McAtee. This is just a reminder for all of us that these systems all interact with each other. Um, I live in a world where behavioral and social sciences lives within a larger biomedical research enterprise. Um, and so helping people understand that our mechanisms and moderators um, occur not only inside the individual but outside the individual as well are particularly important and where a lot of our precision public health comes from. Um, so, a little bit about the precision medicine um, effort. As many of you know, um, it's a small effort, only a million plus people that we're going to try to um, get as volunteers. They will come from two spaces, and I'll talk about these a little bit more, from health provider organizations and direct volunteers. Participants are going to be centrally involved, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of how we're trying to rethink the way participants are engaged in cohort studies a model of scientific research that has engaged participants in open, responsible data sharing with appropriate privacy protections as well. Um, so next slide um, is um, just thinking a bit more about the participation component of this. Um, so true partners in this process. So um, we've already had a fairly significant engagement effort going on, much more yet to do. Um, but thinking more about the types of data we collect, um, the lab analyses we do, what research is conducted, and how the data gets returned. And just as a simple, there are lots of ways in which we're trying to involve participants more in this process, but just as simple ways to think about this, you know, we typically, if you think about the standard cohort we've done in the past, um, we'll give them a newsletter every six months or maybe every three months if we're really being on top of things. This is giving people data back to them in meaningful ways immediately after they provided it to us. And being able to use web and mobile technologies allows us to do that um, fairly well. Um, a transformational approach to diversity. Um, I will tell you this PMI is not a representative sample. It was never intended to be a representative sample. It is an attempt, however, to be as diverse with the U.S. population as possible. I'll remind you that Framingham wasn't a representative sample either, but we managed to get some interesting correlations between behavioral risk factors and health from that. Um, and just given the size and scope, one of the reasons why we thought about needing to just have a very broad and wide and diverse sample is because if you start thinking about small levels of exposure with small genetic variants and small sets of disease groups, those ends of a million get to be pretty small when you multiply 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2. So um, to have an adequate number of subgroups to look at some of these gene by environment interactions, it really requires much larger sample sizes that are easily done and are easily done with a representative sample. So, and then um, our place of data access. So like I said, rapid data sharing both with researchers and participants. Uh, the data collection, just so people know, will start small and will grow over time. This is one of the things I have probably the hardest time getting across to people who are used to traditional cohorts. Because what will happen here is that um, we will do a version one and a version two and a version three, and those will grow over time. But because we're reaching people not in person, not in a data poor way that we've typically done that way, we have to bring them into a clinic or reach or by interview, but instead reach out to them via web and mobile technologies and being able to ping them and say, do you have three minutes to answer five questions about X um, that we can keep adding to this over time and build the database as we move forward and also co-calibrate as newer measures become available with the older measures so we can keep this moving forward as we go. Um, 
So the two methods of engagement, um, the one that we're comfortable with is health provider organizations. The one we're not so comfortable with is direct volunteers. Um, so we have a pretty good idea of how to um, take people from a health provider organization, gather their electronic health record, get them to fill out survey forms, get them to provide a biosample and a physical eval and that kind of thing. That all happens at a, usually in one visit at a health provider organization. The president was very clear, let me go back, the president was very clear that he also wanted with that, um, people to um, be able to raise their hand and say they wanted to volunteer for this project. And if you think about this, that now means that what we have to do is let them come on online, the typical way people would in web and mobile-based efforts, but then they subsequently need to find ways to get their electronic health record, to get their physical exam done, to gather a biospecimen. So the breadth of this across the entire United States it's pretty easy for us to do this in New York or D.C. The participant that's out somewhere in the middle of Wyoming trying to get their physical eval and their bio sample will be um, rather interesting. So, Amy, now I'm ready. Thank you. Um, so um, the things that we'll collect, participant provided information, electronic health records, physical eval, bio specimens, blood and urine right now, though the thought is we'll collect other samples along the way. Um, a real focus on mobile and wearable technologies and being able to leverage that as much as we can and then geospatial environmental data also. Um, and like I said, those will evolve over time. And also it's a tiered approach with participants. So not all participants will do everything. Some will do some subsets, some will do more in-depth analyses of certain types of things. So it'll be a base level of data and then subsequent more in-depth levels of data for certain subgroups of the population. Okay. So quickly so you know the people and the players, the Data Research Center is at Vanderbilt University um, along with the Baylor Institute and barely um, the Google group that will um, help us deal particularly with things like uh, putting all this data in the cloud and making it available. Mayo Clinic is going to handle the Biobank, the Participant Technology Center is at Scripps with a small um, firm called Vibrant Health that's been doing a lot of work in um, mobile-based um, assessment. Um, across a wide range of things, and so they'll help with a lot of the technology components of this. And then health provider organizations of three types. There'll be regional medical centers, there'll be community health centers, federally qualified health centers, and then VA medical centers as well. Um, so a number of different groups that will be participating on the healthcare provider side. So it's a, a combination of patient partnerships, electronic health records, technologies, genomics, and data science, which I haven't spent a lot of time on, but could spend hours talking about how you actually can try to put all this data together. So, but that's, that's the bottom line for all of this. So thank you all for the time. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Bill. We are going to move into the second presentation. Uh, if you have questions, please send them in. We'll address them later. So Kirsten, you're on. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, join in this conversation with you as we try to think about, um, as Bill is saying, going into these data-rich environments, what's the possibility for us for improving health? Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk about um, this Precision Public Health Summit. This was a, a summit that we put on at UCSF at the beginning of June. It was co-sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, the White House. Um, Sue Desmond Hellman is the head of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, had uh, been interested for a while in this idea of precision public health. How can we use um, the best in uh, data and technology to actually help target our public health interventions? She has a nice TED talk on this topic. Um, and she, uh, um, their foundation, who's been really using this language mostly in public health interventions in, in Africa, um, that was their motivation to, to gather um, uh, thought leaders together to, to discuss what's possible here. And I think from the White House's perspective, OSTP, it was, um, as you heard, there has been so much investment in uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, but uh, there, uh, the, the strong desire to make sure that um, 
that uh, that the this investment really reflected uh, um, something that would be a benefit to all communities within the U.S. and really reflect the range of types of factors that we know have an influence on health, I think also was part of the motivation to put this meeting on. We focused on the first thousand days of life, not because precision public health has to do with the first thousand days of life, but because we wanted one focus area um, to bring people together around, and the first thousand days seemed to uh, seem to offer a nice balance both of areas where there is much to be um, learned in terms of discovery research as well as um, clear uh, clear areas where um, where there's possibilities for for interventions next slide so we spent a lot of time arguing about what is precision public health, and I'm sure you have all had these discussions. We argued about should this be precision population health? Should this be precision health? Is this different than precision medicine? I would say um, for, for all of us locally at UCSF who do precision medicine, as we engage in people in the national discussion, I think it was pretty clear that although precision medicine was the term chosen, that, that many people who think about precision medicine are thinking about precision health, and so not just medicine. Um, and I think probably we could have used um, the term precision population health, because really what we're talking about here is the population health side of it. Um, but we chose precision public health and um, be, because uh, we thought it would resonate to uh, the various types of stakeholders we hope to interest in this meeting. Um, we wanted to be deliberately multi-sector, and we thought that this might include words that would resonate with varying different types of people. And then we didn't want to be too strict about what the definition was, because we do think that this is a, a, an evolving concept and set of ideas. And so um, we just broadly speaking uh, said that, you know, we live in an area, an era where there are advancements in measurement data and technology, and how can we apply these, um, these advancements uh, to public health um, issues, broadly speaking, both on the discovery side as well as the intervention side. Next. So here's what I learned as somebody who was uh, putting together this meeting, that when I said those things I just said to you, that people really um, put these ideas together in three big categories of ways. And I, I think you see this reflected very nicely in a lot of the terrific work that, that uh, when Corey has written about all the many ways we might think of precision uh, public health or precision population health. Um, but here's how I categorized in, uh, in talking with our committee and, and Nancy Adler in particular, um, how we've categorized those, some of the ways in which what I think this umbrella term is talking about. The first is, um, how do we understand the science of um, some people have called the exposome, this complex interplay of social, environmental, behavioral determinants of health that we all know and agree are important? How do we understand how those uh, come together to uh, result in, in health or, or illness? And then more specifically, how is, how is uh, the study of these complex um, sort of external factors related to our understanding of of omics uh, biology, which really is about the measurements, the more detailed measurements at multi-levels of the individual. So, and I think for many of us who think on both sides of this equation, I think really when we understand both um, uh, the, 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 the more detailed uh, factors that contribute to health in the individual, but then in the context of the other social and environmental factors, that's probably when we're going to be the best at doing the things that precision medicine has as, as its goal, and that uh, part of what we think precision population, precision public health is, is really to bring these together in an important way. The second big area, I think, has to do with um, how do we actually target our population health interventions more effectively because we have better data, um, better integration of data, and better technology. Um, how do we, those things that we think of as population in level interventions, can we, um, how can we use what we know about um, variations across smaller subsets of the population and down to individual level variation to target what we think of as population level interventions most effectively. 
that's the second area. And then the third area, um, because when we think of a precision public health, many people are thinking of um, the diversity in our populations, sometimes more marginalized populations. Uh, um, and, uh, and that for some people, precision public health really invoked um, uh, an inclusion of diverse populations and a focus on the health conditions that affect them in the era of precision medicine. And I think all three of these categories are extremely important. They're extremely important strands and themes in all of the work um, that is being done. I would say we didn't focus as much on the last on the last segment um, uh, on just including uh, diverse populations in precision medicine, not because it's not important, but because, um, but because we felt that the other two areas were ones that we wanted to explore more fully. I will say that there was so much resonance in the first two areas that I think it is a natural linkage as a way to engage a broader sets of communities in the type of work that we are talking about. But the specific category number three probably wasn't as much of a focus in this particular um, meeting. Next slide. So these are the um, next two slides are slides of my colleague Tom Boyce, who's a um, pediatrician, developmental biologist, and who really laid out sort of the crux of what does it mean to bring people together to talk about um, precision medicine and precision public health. And I think we just want to acknowledge, just as uh, Bill showed, that very that that for many people, precision medicine is the antithesis of what we are doing in public health. And I think at the crux of what we wanted to accomplish in the summit was to say um, that these perspectives need to be in the same room together and to talk together and to think about what advancements can mean when they come together. And so I think Tom very nicely laid out the argument here is that for centuries public health and medicine uh, have labored as distant and largely estranged health sciences siblings, each regarding the other with a level of vague suspicion and slightly moralistic derision. Uh, what he talked about is that the emerging precision science, and here we were talking about the first thousand days, is now disallowing this familial disjunction, demanding a more convergent synthetic view that involves both public health and medicine. And that from this point forward, understanding and intervening upon the genesis of human morbidities will almost certainly require a collaborative interaction, interactive knowledge of both broad social, physical, environmental exposures and individual biological variation in susceptibility to these exposures. Next slide. And so here, if we put uh, that uh, on the one side, precision medicine, uh, um, the blind spot for precision medicine is often uh, the powerful role of social and environmental exposures. That strictly speaking, those who are focused on the measurements on the individual, um, the, the blind spot may, may not be, may be not fully taking into account those broader social environmental exposures. On the other hand, on the public health side, where um, the, the, the broad social environmental and behavioral uh, factors that contribute to health are really the lifeblood of public health, it's the individual variability, the biological susceptibility that an individual might have that is really perhaps uh, the point of, that is the, the, the realm of, of science that's not fully taken into account from the standard public health side. And what Tom has laid out here is that only through a through partnership of precision medicine and public health will we allow for three-dimensional insights into how we might uh, protect and sustain, in this case, the critically formative first thousand days of life. But of course, I think we would say would apply to all types of inquiry uh, related to um, the range of, of uh, human disease that we're interested in. Next slide. So um, we had about 150 people um, uh, 
uh, attend our meeting, um, we took a deliberate um, unconference approach. That is, while we had a few presentations um, at the beginning of the day to get people uh, to, to give a sense of the types of things we might be talking about, um, mostly we wanted people to, to develop and create their own breakout groups. And um, I'm going to use this opportunity of having the, the, the faces here on the screen to tell you about the types of things, the more concrete examples, to give you a flavor of the things that um, we talked about and the, and the things um, so, so as to, to start the conversation. And then I'll, I'm going to end with the three um, sort of major themes that came out of this. So on the top of the middle full picture, that's my colleague Esteban Bouchard, and Esteban Bouchard is a studies um, asthma in, uh, uh, he's a, it, he does genetics of asthma, and he's very interested in variation and drug response in populations. And as you probably know, that there are uh, large variations across racial and ethnic groups in uh, rates of asthma. And um, what he has very nicely shown is uh, how genetic ancestry is related both to patterns of asthma as well as drug response to asthma. And his work, which is really a sort of a genetic epidemiology lab, has really, and they have very nice and, and uh, race ethnically diverse cohorts of, of children. Uh, he, he has made uh, many measures of environmental and social factors and has really uh, been at, uh, I think, at the forefront in really helping to understand um, both the genetic factors that predispose to variations in, in asthma response as well as uh, the epigenetics and how do we understand um, how those environmental factors um, interact with the genetic factors to both um, uh, predict uh, asthma as well as response to therapy. At the meeting, uh, so that would be a, a nice example within the, the asthma context. At the meeting, we also had um, uh, uh, Rob Kahn from Cincinnati Children's who has been doing nice work on the, the health system side where they have basically in their electronic health records integrated um, social and environmental uh, determinants of health into their electronic health records. So when they have a child with asthma, um, they know that the readmissions for asthma re really re um, pertains to both the medications that we give them as physicians, but also um, their uh, social and environmental exposures. And so at Cincinnati Children, when children are discharged with asthma, they get automatic referrals to, um, to the types of social services that might help them them to, uh, to intervene on those environmental factors that contribute to their asthma risk. And that would include services to uh, referrals to legal aid for, um, for um, housing services. They have mined the data in their area. They know where their um, asthma readmissions are coming from, and they even uh, use that data to help um, uh, pinpoint a, a particular apartment complex where many of the asthma readmissions were coming from, and then it now have a very nice program with the community to help sort of intervene in that, uh, to, to in a very targeted way with, with that um, housing environment. So an example then across the asthma of both discovery and intervention uh, related to both biological susceptibility, but how biology intersects with, um, with the environment, and I think those were really great examples. And the bottom left is one of... Um, uh, the community participants in our preterm birth initiative. Preterm birth is seven times more common in, in African Americans than in other populations. There is, uh, while we know some about the biology of preterm birth, there is so much that is unknown and there are clearly strong environmental, uh, behavioral, social determinants that contribute. And I, I think thinking in this uh, multi-level fashion um, has allowed the scientists at UCSF who are thinking about preterm birth, um, both to engage the community as, um, as uh, participants themselves in uh, to um, to describe the types of stressors that uh, that might predispose uh, to uh, preterm birth. We had tech. Uh, tech companies that were there that were really um, helping to uh, to improve our ability, as Bill said, to understand stressors um, and to measure those stressors. Um, so between the community voice um, talking about uh, um, 
how they, the factors that they believe are contributing to preterm birth in, in the communities, the tech companies that were in our area really helping to develop the sensors, and then those intersecting with the, the people who are generating the real biological hypotheses on, on uh, what factors relate to preterm birth. It's been a very nice um, example of multi-partnerships, collaborations coming together to address a a, a biological problem that still is um, has has much uh, has a long way to go in terms of, uh, uh, of of helping to elucidate why we still have such high rates in some communities. Next slide. So we did this two days, 136 participants. We had 21 breakout groups. I was really pleased with how many people were engaged. And it's a little bit scary, I will just say, putting on a multi-sector meeting like this. But um, but people were really highly energized. And in some ways, I think we did tap in to people, even people who were really strongly biological determinists and people who were really coming at it from the very public health point of view or the community point of view. There was really high level of engagement. And I, I the next three slides are going to talk about the, the themes that, um, that I think emerged. And I would urge you to look at the report because it develops these a little bit more. So I think the top theme was the theme of, of social justice. Although it is not inherent in what we are talking about, I think the, the urgency of health disparities is, um, is at its core or was at its core for this meeting that really, I think, energized and motivated a lot of the discussions. And I think when, for those of us who uh, approach this topic from a perspective of populations that are disproportionately affected by poor health, we know that those are inherently multi-factor um, and that, uh, and that while, while neither precision medicine nor precision public health is inherently about disparities, um, the approaches that, that, um, they, they, health disparities are about uh, groups that are disproportionately affected by by illness, and um, and that the factors that relate to the 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 patterns of disparities that we see in some communities are are certainly um, uh, include um, uh, the social, environmental, structural factors that uh, that put individuals, families, and communities at higher risk uh, for poor health. And so, the social justice theme um, of both acknowledging the disparities that exist figuring out the sectors that must align in order for disparities uh, for disparities to be addressed, um, understanding the framework by which um, uh, transdisciplinary uh, collaborations can uh, can occur, uh, all required an acknowledgement of, um, of this uh, social justice lens. So that was a very strong theme. Next. The second theme was about uh, data sharing. Most of what we were talking about was coming um, was uh, had to do with uh, data that uh, was coming across multiple sectors. Um, there was a strong call for there to be more accessibility of data, open sharing of data, whether that came from um, biological genetic data to uh, integration of. Uh, biological data with data from other sources, uh, the commitment to multi-level data con collection and data sharing was there. Um, the, the initial extension of this was that this required much more thoughtful planning and, uh, and commitment if this was new data collection, if it was uh, sharing of existing data, um, the ethics and the ethical uh, principles that would underlie uh, data sharing, I think, were, um, were at the forefront of of a lot of this discussion, particularly as it related to um, community level data. Third, and then the last theme was uh, the theme of, of community engagement. Uh, and um, we were really fortunate to have um, uh, community participant participation in this conference. And I think that this was community engagement, partnership, and, and leadership are key, both as um, as um, because of uh, their knowledge that they themselves are part of this knowledge network that we are talking about in terms of, uh, of uh, the data that they, community members themselves, can provide, uh, but also as we think through the entire um, spectrum through intervention, um, the, the importance there. And, uh, and the very strong themes here of the deliberate actions to develop citizen scientists, which is um, part of the precision uh, medicine initiative. 
initiative and uh, and leaders, I think, was really um, quite quite exciting uh, and engaging. Next slide. So, you know, I would urge you to to uh, to read the report. Um, again, this isn't meant to be the final word. It's meant to be um, the the themes that I think we're, we we flesh out further um, that that were important as we brought together. Um, many people to discuss this particular topic. Um, and, and I think here the, the themes of transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, multi-sector teams were really important as these things continue. I know we're short on time. I would just say, um, because it's such an opportunity to talk to people who are interested in cancer, because I do think that, that the NCI and the National Cancer Institute in this area has so much um, to contribute. As the and the institute and the you know the the area of inquiry that certainly is at the forefront of everything that we are thinking about in terms of precision medicine, applying all we know about measurements of individuals to provide the best types of uh, diagnosis and, and, and treatments for cancer, um, the promise of precision medicine, I think, is, is most clear, in, certainly in the cancer realm. But cancer is also the field, to me, that I think of most prominently when I think of population strategies for um, for screening and for prevention. And um, now as somebody here who, you know, one of my other hats that I wear is as the chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, when I am trying to think what we will be looking at in the future, how will we understand in and integrate what we know about individual level variation um, into uh, how we think about our population level um, strategies for intervening, I think that is both exciting and daunting. I think we are we are still uh, trying to understand how we will bring those types of disciplines and discussions together. And I'm, I'm really, um, really want to commend you for having these discussions because I think that this is this is exactly what we should be doing. And um, and I think you know, the, uh, cancer will certainly be the area where we will probably be having these discussions most specifically. Um, uh, 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 more quickly than probably in, in other areas. So I'm going to stop and hopefully we'll have some time for a discussion now. Okay. Thank you so much, Kirsten. This is Moeen again. We have about 10 minutes for Q's and A's, and as people submit their questions online, I, first I'd like to thank both you and Bill for uh, very stimulating talks. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up. Uh, and I have one question to uh, the same question asked to both of you. Okay, so we've heard that uh, this new area of data rich environment um, will have be, be able to join both biological determinants of health with social uh, determinants of health. But how do we translate it into action? So, right now, it's easy enough on the precision medicine side, i.e., the genes, drugs, and disease people are. Uh, viewing early success stories, whether it's cancer treatments uh, matched to the, to the genomes of the tumors, uh, or on the uh, cohort side where they're trying to discover new uh, gene hits that would hopefully transform into drugs. Okay, so uh, that is sort of a pathway for them to see sort of the low-hanging fruits of success. So if we are to add the multi-level determinants of health, uh, let's say on top of a PMI, what would it look like and how would um, early success be defined? I mean, let's say fast forward five years from now, and uh, Bill will start with you since you are in the room while Kirsten uh, summons her thoughts. I should just to think about this a little bit. I, uh, I, thought the first of, <laughs> I thought Kirsten's last point was really good because she thinks about it from the Preventive Medicine Task Force um, perspective, you know, that because um, our, our, those task force recommendations had been very much average population across all populations, all groups, right? Not thinking about necessarily, um, and I don't, again, we don't have the data yet to, to say this, but um, are there subgroups of populations for which these things would be more effective or less effective? Should we be targeting our interventions at the population level more to specific subgroups or not? Um, are there, and I think this gets really tricky, are there even genetic predispositions that would make us think that, yes, this is a necessary condition, we should have walkable trails and, and safe environments for everybody to walk in, but here are some other factors genetically, and those groups of people we might have to do something more in addition to other than just making available the sort of things that would make them more physically active. 
I think some of those kind of things we need to think through a little bit more, but it's, it's a great question. Anything you would add to the data collection of the PMI? That's more, <coughs> it looks like a lot of the variables are still personal variables or <coughs> individual uh, levels. They are. I think one of the things we need to do is expand the social and environmental determinant component, especially on the GIS data. Um, we're going to have to get a lot better on location data than we are. We'll probably have to use some sensor technologies, especially on social exposures. I'm really worried that the, one of the harder things to do is understand social interaction at, a, at an automated level. I mean, we can always ask people, but those social exposures are so critical, and I think it's hard for us to gather that data, and we're going to have to find some ways to make sure we do that. Kirsten, anything you want to add? Yeah, no, I think I think that 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 is right. So when I think of sometimes I so I work in a safety net setting, and sometimes when they ask about precision medicine and precision public health, you know, it's like you know, well, what is it really? But how is it really going to help me? I think if when we just think about. Um, uh, you know, at cancer screening, for example, I think the prospect of, of being able to understand how to target some of these um, population level interventions more specifically actually does offer a lot of promise. And for some in my resource constrained setting, the ability to target actually has benefit, right? This is, this is, um, that is something you can actually get people behind to do it. I would love to know and be able to interact with people and have those discussions, or how, how will we know? When will we know that we can tailor our public, our, our population level interventions most effectively? I, I have a colleague who, who wants to, to understand how he can use the data to, to, um, so that we have multiple choices for our cancer screening for colorectal cancer. Well, he would like to be able to use more predictive analytics to figure out how to be targeted most effectively so that what he offers an individual patient in the room is the one that that person is likely to get. We have so many things that we know that that, um, that mostly what we want to do is have uh, individuals actually um, that, you know, use our use the interventions that we have, and there's a lot. I think there is promise for analytics, just like they're used in many other areas to to do that here as well. Thank you. We're going to turn into some questions that we received online. So go ahead. Great. The first one I think is for you, Bill. Can you expand upon what you mean by participant partnerships? Yeah. So. Um, for PMI, um, what we're thinking about in terms of participants is, uh, you know, the, the typical thing that we do is we have the standard sort of community engagement group, right? And, and they, you know, we, we meet with them in some token way. And I'm not trying to understand the way we've done this in the past, but I think we all acknowledge the fact that we really have embedded participants truly as partners in this process. Um, now, that doesn't mean at the far end of the spectrum that they're going to be determining what type of proteomics of analysis we're going to do, right? We still have to have expertise to do certain things. But I think it's going to be really critical that the types of questions we ask, the things that are more important, whether it's more critical and we're looking at like version two of the uh, survey data, should we ask more questions about sleep than we typically are or not? Those types of things we can actually get participants engaged in and helping us look at some of the data. And the other side of this is that Kirsten mentioned as well, is that uh, the citizen scientist perspective of this, the, the perspective that we have in PMI right now is that at the very aggregate level, that data is available to everyone, including all the participants in the study, for them to be able to look at this data at a very aggregate level, understand their neighborhood, their community, what other people like them are doing and thinking and their health and that sort of thing as well. So. Here's another question, I think, towards both of you. Uh, the ecological view of public health was identified by IOM publications almost 20 years ago, integrating social, environmental, and biological determinants of health. What makes precision public health different? First, I'll let you take that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so, thanks a lot. So, um, so it's really been important to me for this not to be something that is different. I don't, this is not something new. We didn't newly create these ways of thinking. I think that this, the, the, to me, uh, part of these efforts are in reaction to 
some people's view of precision medicine as something that was very narrow and that the answer lies in um, more and better and uh, more detailed measurements on the individual to target therapies on the individual. Um, this was meant to, to be a way to use the same terminology of precision, but to think in that way you just described of these multi-levels. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, is that useful if it, if, it, if, it, if it just is heard by people as a way to say, this is what we do and that's what we, they do, that's not helpful. What, what, I, what we were hoping in bringing people together under these words is that it would bring more people into the room, um, including people who are thinking about precision and precision medicine as maybe more classically or narrowly defined, as well as um, these broader sort of social environmental context. So right. meant to be broad, not narrow. So let, let me give you my uh, my anecdote here. Um, this is my inquiry again. Um, uh, I remember uh, Sue Desmond Hellman visited CDC uh, just before I, we had the first debate with Sandra Galea back in May, and she gave her vision and view of precision public health or global health. And we had 25 people, sort of leaders in public health programs at CDC, and one of them, and I won't mention any names, uh, took me aside at the end, and, and they said, oh, I didn't know we had been doing precision public health all along. So basically, <laughs> You know, precision, I mean, uh, as medicine becomes more precise because you have more data, more analytics, uh, public health will become more precise because you'll, you'll be able to measure things with more precision. I mean, environmental variables or neighborhood variables. So there is really nothing magical about the words. Uh, we're, we're just going to do our job better and with more precision than ever before. So I, I think we have uh, time maybe for one question, um, and then we will close. So, Amy? And Kit, and I think this last one is directed towards you as well. How do you see precision public health changing the way that public health uses the targeting of high-risk population groups? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I, again, I do think that, um, that this is, uh, I think in one way, um, public health has been doing this already. There are many, many, many examples. Um, I think that um, that my hope is that we, again, that we bring more people into the room to start to have those conversations about about how do we do targeting. I know that in some ways, it, at its core, the targeting is sometimes antithetical to many people's um, view of public health. But I think that um, it, it, we're, we're sort of sometimes get trapped into a false dichotomy, that it's only the population or the individual. And there's lots of ways by which understanding um, sort of a variation, even across populations, that we can do our jobs in public health in a much more meaningful and effective, and I will not to belabor the cost, but in a cost-effective way, because, um, because understanding Understanding um, more about populations and population variability actually helps us to be more effective in the things that we are trying to do. It's often happening in public health, um, but describing this as, as antithetical to public health is what I always view as the danger. Um, but I, I think um, more willingness to engage in discussions about this is important. Okay, thank you. We just want to say thank you again to our presenters, Kirsten and Bill, as well as our moderators, and to you all out there for joining us for this webinar. So you may disconnect us at this time, and have a good rest of your week, everyone. Thanks, everyone.